are in a series called Perhaps the Lord. Perhaps the Lord. Somebody say, Perhaps the Lord. What a faith-filled statement, is it not? When, when you say, Perhaps the Lord, you are giving God the opportunity to do God things. Sometimes we are limited in our own ability and in our own thinking. But when you say, perhaps the Lord, you're saying, God, maybe, just maybe. I know that I can't, but I believe that you can. And it invites God into our lives and into our situations. We kicked this off several weeks ago, talking out of 1 Samuel 14, and we shared the story of of Jonathan and his armor bearer as they went into battle against the Philistines. Uh, Two weeks ago, we talked about Esther. And we said that Esther, for such a time as this, that one girl revolution, how God used a little orphan girl, brought her into the kingdom, gave her the platform as queen, and she saved an entire nation. If you were here last week, how many of you were here last week? We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Rack, Shack, and Benny. Come on, you remember that? Those three Hebrew boys that that stood in that fire. We talked about three levels of faith where they said, Lord, we know that you can, and we believe that you will, but even if you don't. Oh, and I felt like, you know, this series has been so good for us as a church. Today, I want to talk to you out of 2 Samuel chapter 10. If you're taking notes, write this down somewhere. The, The title of the message today is this, Let Us Be Courageous. Let us be courageous. I want to talk to you about courage out of 2 Samuel chapter 10. Now, this story is a hidden gem in the Old Testament. This is not a real popular passage. It's not going to be as familiar to some of you as some of the other things we've discussed. But there's gold in the Old Testament. How many know what I'm talking about? If we can kind of dig through, unearth some layers, man, there's some, this story, and I've never preached on this before, but this is like a hidden gem. Have you ever eating Chick-fil-A and, and <laughs> what y'all laughing at me for? You know, you, you eat your 12-count nuggets, all that Polynesian sauce, you even got your waffle fries and dip it in ranch, and you think you're done, and you get ready to throw your bag away, but you look down in the bottom of the bag, and you see that waffle fry left. It's the bonus fry, right? Man, and it's just, what? How did you get there? It's a game changer. You didn't expect it, but you found it. Or, or, or have you ever gone in your closet and you're getting dressed and you put on your, your, your favorite blue jeans, you get them on, and then you put your hands in your pocket and you find a $20 bill? Come on, somebody say, good day. Oh, man, a little discovery, a little surprise. You didn't know it was there, but bam, $20 makes a difference. I can go to Chick-fil-A on 20 bucks. This is a hidden gem, and I want to give you some context before we dive into the text. I think it's important that you have an understanding of the backdrop before we read the scriptures. The Bible tells us that David was king of Israel at the time, and he had a good friend who was the king of Ammon, the Ammonites. And this king of the Ammonites passed away. And so David sent several ambassadors over to Ammon to express their condolences on behalf of the nation of Israel and David's great love for this king, he sends some ambassadors to express their sorrow. Well, when the king died, his son came into power. And so his son was very suspicious of these ambassadors from Israel. In fact, he thought that David sent these guys to spy out the land. He thought, well, now that my dad is dead, he's sending these ambassadors to explore the weaknesses of our territory, and so I know he's coming to try to take over. So instead of receiving the ambassadors with grace and dignity, what he did was he took these guys and he shaved off half their beards, he cut their robes off at the behind, exposing their backside, and just humiliated them and shamed them. He sent them back to Israel shamed. And David said, no, 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 okay, guys, stay in Jericho until your beard grows back, until there's time to restore your dignity, but I'm going to take this wrong situation, and I'm going to make it right. You see, the king of Ammon had, had misjudged the motives of David. How many of you know sometimes you'll do the right thing, but people will still criticize you, and they'll say you're disingenuous? You know, they'll they'll question your motives. And so David, after this humiliation, tells his commanding officer, Joab, he says, Joab, we've got to take a stand. 
We've got to do something for this nation and for the dignity of our ambassadors. And so that as they approached, as they approached the king of the Ammonites, as they, they prepare for battle, I want you to see what happens here. Second Samuel chapter 10, starting with verse 9. The Bible says, when Joab saw that the battle was set against him both in the front and in the rear, he chose some of the best men of Israel. Notice what he did. He chose some of the best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Syrians. The rest of his men he put in charge of Abishai, his brother, and arrayed them against the Ammonites. Now notice what's happened here. Joab is bringing the Israelite army to war. But when he gets there, he realizes that he's flanked. He's not just facing the Ammonites in front, but behind him are the Syrians. Okay, and I want you to know this about the devil that opposes you. He's not just going to attack you from one direction. He's going to attack you in multiple directions. In fact, you're going to fight on multiple fronts. Do you see the battle scheme here? Joab realizes, wait a second, it's a trap. It's a setup. Come on, somebody say setup. Tell you this, the devil will set you up to get you upset. Are you with me? It's a setup. It's a trap. Some of you are, are, are fighting battles in your own family. Some of you are, are wrestling with issues with your children, and, and your focus is all about your kids. But then you come down with sickness, or you go see the doctor, and you get a doctor's report, and now you're fighting battles on two fronts. Are you with me? It's not just about the kids, but now you're being attacked in your body. Or maybe you were working at a job for 15 or 20 years, and, and they're, they're having layoffs, and so you got laid off from work, and so now it's not just your kids and your physical body, but it's your finances. Do you see how the enemy will set you up on multiple fronts, surrounded by the enemy? Joab and the Israelites realize, wait a second, it's not just coming from one direction. Have you discovered that about life? that you fight battles in multiple directions. And the reason why I think the enemy will use this to try to distract us and confuse us. If you're distracted, how many know you can't focus? When you focus, you can fight. But when you have things happening simultaneously, are you with me today? Man, what is going on all around you? Have you seen these, um, um, have you ever been to a circus and seen the, like this, this man that'll step into a cage with lions and you think, man, what is wrong with that dude? And, and he's, well, he's got a, like a whip in one hand and what does he carry in the other hand? A chair or a stool. You ever wondered why he's got a stool? If you're faced with a lion, how many things you need more than just a stool? What are you gonna do, pull up a chair and just sit down and have a conversation? You know why a lion tamer will have a stool in his hand? Because that stool, if you notice, he will point that stool toward the lion with the legs first. And you know what the lion's trying to do? The lion is trying to focus on all four legs at the same time. And guess what? As powerful as that lion is, that stool creates confusion. And the, the attack or the strength of the lion is mitigated because he's off balance. Do you see, now watch this. Do you see how the devil will use multiple fronts when he attacks? How many of you are, are in a battle right now and it's coming from multiple directions? Okay, only three of you. <laughs> when the enemy surrounds you, I want you to see, I'm going to talk to you about courage today. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, the choice for courage. Courage is a choice. Notice what Joab did. When he realized there were multiple fronts of the enemy, he chose some of the best men of Israel. Listen to me, believers. Fear comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. Fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of man, uh, fear that we won't have enough money, fear that our kids are not going to turn out right, fear of the future. How many know fear comes in all different shapes and sizes? I read a recent study the science of fear. Literally, they, they believe this, that we are born with two fears, that every one of us innately have two fears. First of all, we have a fear of falling, fear of falling. Have you ever been in bed at night and you're dreaming and you, you just feel like you're free falling? You're like, <laughs> and you wake up, you're like, oh my, what was that? You know, fear of falling, that all of us have a fear of falling. The other is fear of Loud noises. 
So if fear of falling and fear of loud noises are innately, we're born with those fears. You know what that tells me? Every other fear is learned. It's learned. We learn. Now, now fear will jump on your insecurities and try to exaggerate them. Fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. The devil wants you to think it's true, and it looks like it is, but it's not. You see, fear will keep you in jobs that you hate. Fear will keep you in relationships that are toxic. Fear will keep you in habits that you can't break. Are you with me? But I want to tell you this. You, the good news is this. You have the power to choose. I want to talk to you about the choice for courage. You can choose. Now, listen, we can't help how we feel, but we can decide what to do with those feelings. Are you with me? Now, you can't help being anxious or, you know, when fear bumps into you, you're like, oh, hello, fear. Thanks for checking in. But you're not in charge. See, listen, your feelings report to you, but they don't rule you. Are you with me today? Boy, y'all are quiet. I mean, y'all got rowdy yesterday when LSU beat Alabama. I'm trying to give you something even better today. Your feelings are gauges, but they're not guides. Don't allow a feeling to hijack the call of God on your life. You can make some decisions, okay? I know this worry has checked in, concern, anxiety, stress, fear. All these things are checking in, but they're not in charge. I can make a decision. Now, listen, I can't choose my storm, but I can choose my spirit in the storm. I can say, okay, when, when fear comes knocking on my door, guess what? Faith can answer the door. Listen, the, the definition of courage, okay? This, this may, you got to think about this for a moment. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage quite possibly is being afraid but going anyway. It's moving forward in spite of your fear. You know, in order to conquer your fear, you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to do some things afraid. Joab sees that he's flanked by the Syrians as well as fighting the Ammonites, and he says, I got to choose. I've got some decisions to make. When you're surrounded, you don't have to surrender. You don't have to back down just because you're outnumbered and outmanned. Some of you are surrounded by circumstances and worry and fear and doubt is coming against you. But you can say, you know what? I am choosing to trust in the goodness of my God. I'm going to believe what God says regardless of how I feel. Are you with me today? You see, the choice for courage is a big one. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. I think courage is a requirement for every believer. You're going to be tested at every level of growth. And when you reach a new level, there's always a new devil. Man, when you say, Lord, bring me higher, guess what? Then the battle becomes fierce. You're going to be required to operate in courage. You say, Mike, I just don't feel like I can. Wait, wait, wait. Feelings, thank you for checking in, but you're not in charge. Look at what it says here, verse 11. So Joab says this to his brother. He says, hey, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Now, notice what he's doing here. He's talking to his brother Abishai. Abishai was one of David's mighty men. Here, Joab is the commander of all the forces, but his brother Abishai, he's over a certain regiment. And he tells his brother, he said, look, I'm going to attack the Ammonites. And if they're too strong for me, you better come and have my back. You attack, you attack the Syrians, and if you need help, let me know, and I'll be right there. You see, here's the second thing I want you to see. Not only the choice for courage, but I want you to see this. Number two, the community of courage. You see, we gain courage when we are together. He says, I'm going to help you. I know you're going to help me. They realized we can't fight this battle alone. 
As good as you are, you're still going to need help from somewhere else. Does that make sense? You know, a couple weeks ago when we hosted a marriage conference, one of the things, Julie Mullen said this, and I thought this was so good, so good. So I wanted to make sure the whole church had a chance to hear this statement. Because sometimes we will experience crisis in our marriage or in a relationship or in an issue, and we won't know what to do. And she said this, you may not always know what to do, but you can know where to go to get the help that you need. You don't always have to have all the answers. Well, I've, I'm in a situation. I don't know what to do. I think all of us have been there. You don't have to know what to do, but you can know where to go. Guess where you go? The church. The house of God. In, in, in this realm, there is spiritual community. And there is strength when God's people come together. I love the house of God. How many of you love church? I love it. And I'm not talking about a building either. I'm not talking about bricks and sticks. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about you. I, now, listen, I have great worship when I'm by myself, but I worship so much better when I get to worship with you. I have great prayer when I'm by myself in my prayer closet. But you know what? I feel like my prayer goes to another level when I'm praying with you. Why? Because together we're better. Now, the church, I know we have our problems, do we not? We've got our issues, you know, we have our weaknesses. There's some things that we've not gotten right over the years. And I'm talking about the church, you know, globally. Uh, man, we've got our problems. We always say this every week, I- I'm not perfect. The church is not a perfect place. But guess what? We're still the bride of Christ. The bride. Uh, uh, married folk. How, how many married folk we got? You Okay. How many of you know something about your spouse that nobody else knows? And you see them in their best, but you also know them in their worst. And you could probably say some things about them that, that, that you would never allow anybody else to say about them. Are you with me? You see, Rachel is my bride. 23 years we've been married. We got three kids. We got any, meeny, money. We ain't having no mo. I know her in her worst, and guess what? I know it. I can say something to her about it, but you better not be saying it to her. How many know? Look, as my bride, come on now, talk to me. And I wonder if Jesus is, wait a second, don't be trashing the church. Don't be criticizing my bride. I died for her. I'm redeeming her. I'm restoring her. I love her. Jesus loves the church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build what? My church. Whose church is it? It's not your church to criticize. It's his church to redeem. Oh, come on. I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Church is one of the best ideas God ever had. And if you don't feel like you need to be in church, you might be smarter than God. Now, listen, in an age of information, I know we have unfettered access to podcasts you know, YouTube sermons, man, social media sound bites, and there are amazing preachers and evangelists and teachers, and thank God for all of it. But guess what? When you're sick and in the hospital, a podcast from your favorite preacher is not going to minister to you. The body of Christ. Come on, somebody. And as much as I love Joel Osteen, he's not coming to Lady of the Lake to pray over you. I love T.D. Jakes and Joyce Meyer and Jensen Franklin and all of them, but guess what you need? You need the brothers and sisters in the Lord. Come on. You need a community of courage. Listen to the scripture, Psalm 26, 8. I love your sanctuary, O Lord. It's the place where your glorious presence dwells. I just love the house of God. I've got my own Hamanite version of it right here. My translation is this. God, I enjoy hanging out at your house. It's where you do your best stuff. Oh, I'm so thankful for the house. You have ministered to me in ways that you don't even know. You see, we live in an age where everybody wants to be a free agent. Oh, I'm a free agent. I'm going to take my talents too. Come on, somebody. Guys say, okay, well, thank God for free agency, but I do my best work in a team. Yeah, well, Mike, it's just me and Jesus. That's, I don't need anybody. Me and Jesus. Wait a second. Jesus didn't say that. 
Jesus said, listen, I'm going to choose 12 people. I'm going to choose a team. Are you with me? You see, there's a community that helps to build our courage. We get courage. God is the source, but you know what? He uses human hands and human hearts oftentimes to give it to us. Does that make sense? I love, you know, this past, this year, 2019, honestly, 2019 has been the, the most difficult year I've ever walked through. It has. This has been the hardest year for me and for my family. We have had attacks on our physical body. We have health issues. We've had challenges with our children. There, I mean, I can feel how the enemy has come against us personally and how he, he has attacked the church. And I'll never forget sitting down a, a couple months ago with some of my small group guys, and I just unpacked it. I said, look, guys, here's where I'm at, and I just vomited. Have you ever done that? Oh, man, you're like, pastor, for real, you? Oh, yes, baby. I don't bounce around from one glory cloud to the next. I'm living in the same world that you're living in, facing the same battles that you're fighting, and I need help. I need people in my life to help encourage me. And I sat down with these guys, and there was a little bit of risk because I'm thinking, man, will they judge me? Will they think less of me? Will they think I'm ill-equipped to lead? Will they still trust me? And you know what I felt in that moment? I felt the arms of heaven through these men reach down and wrap me up. And you know what they said? We got you. You see, some of you are going to be fighting a battle where the enemy is going to be taking the advantage and you feel like you're losing. If you don't have the body of Christ, if you don't have friendship and relationship to come help you in those moments, come on. Listen, the the more you sweat in peacetime, the less you bleed in war. Come on, all of you military men and women. The more you sweat in peacetime, the less you bleed in war. Mike, what are you saying? Use this time. Maybe you're not fighting a battle. Maybe it's peacetime for you. Use this time to build relationships. Get in a small group. Serve on a team on the weekend. Make a commitment to the house of God because when you sweat in peacetime, you won't bleed as much in war. You'll have brothers and sisters who will stand with you. They'll fight for you. You you remember back in the day playing the the, the game Red Rover, Red Rover? How many members that game? Oh, I love that. That was one of my favorite games to play at recess. Get out there at recess. You got two lines facing each other, and you'd say like, Red Rover, Red Rover. Send Billy right over. Little Billy hears his name called. He's like, oh. What was Billy supposed to do? He's going to take off running, and his sole purpose is to break through that line. And if he can bust that line apart, he can take one back with him. But what little Billy doesn't know is this. You come toward this line, I'm not just holding hands, but I'm locking arms with my brothers. And if you come at me, I'm going to take this and clothesline you right up under your chin like this. Come on, holla. Little Billy going to be flying. Why? Because I've locked arms with some people who love me. There's a community of courage. Listen, Red Rover, Red Rover, the devil's coming right over, and he wants you to break rank. He wants you, ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost now. He wants to isolate you and disconnect you from the community of believers. Mm, 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 mm. Look at Acts Acts 28, 15. In in fact, let me say this. When you're connected to other believers, you receive encouragement. Now, think about that. Write down the word encourage. Write down down that word. You know what the word encourage means? It literally means to put courage into. We're talking about courage today. If you have godly friendships, then encouragement is literally placing courage inside of you for the fight. Discouragement is the opposite. Discouragement pulls courage from you. Encouragement places it in you. When you're in the body of Christ, guess what? You need to find some prayer warriors. When you're fighting a battle, get you some people who know how to touch heaven and bring it to earth. When when you're part of the family of God, those who have the gift of serving, let them serve you. Those that have the gift of giving, let them give to you. Those that have the gift of, of leadership, let them lead. You see, there's so many gifts in the body of Christ. And if we're not connected to this community, then we're going to fight the enemy in isolation. 
Acts 28, 15, Paul is being transported. He's a prisoner. He's being transported to Rome. Look at what it says here. And from there, when the brothers, the brothers, the brothers, the family, the the community of courage, when they heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appium Forum and the three inns. When Paul saw them, watch this. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took what? Just the sight of spiritual family brought courage to his soul. I want you to know, just looking at you on Sunday, being with you in moments like this, I feel like I can charge hell with a water pistol. You know, about 10 years ago, we were flying somewhere. I think we were going overseas, and I was with Jeff Rentz. We, we were, had a connection in Detroit, so we're in the Detroit International Airport, and we were on one of these escalators, and it wasn't one that brought you up, but it was one of those escalators that shoots you across the floor. How many knows what I'm talking about? In the long corridors, and so in order to get you there faster, you just stand on one of those, and boom, you, you kind of take off. And so there wasn't a whole lot of people. It was just Jeff and I, and we were standing there, and I noticed on the escalator coming to us, facing us about 150 yards in front of me there was one guy and he let out a big scream he's like oh i was like oh that's that's weird just felt a little strange i didn't know something wrong with him he's just making some loud and he's getting closer to us you know and it's kind of one of those deals as he's getting closer he's hollering and i'm thinking okay do i look at him (laughs) Because if I look, you know what I'm saying? If you look, you're like, you're like engaged. You know, it's like you're, okay, now I'm involved. I got, there's some sort of responsibility I have in all of this. I didn't want, I wanted to avoid him altogether because it was a little awkward. But he's yelling and he's looking right at me. Go! And so I made the mistake of looking at him and our eyes locked. And he looks at me, he said, go! And then I looked at his shirt. He had an LSU Tiger shirt on. And then I realized, wait a second, I got an LSU Tiger shirt on too. And he noticed that about me. And so when he yelled, go, I said, Tigers. And it was strange, but we had a moment. It's kind of one of those, I just need to hug him right now. Okay, you're weird, I love you, but we're part of the same family. Come on, forever LSU, what's up? Just the sight of him, one team, one heartbeat. What, 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 what? We're, we're together. You know, when I see you in the community, and sometimes I see these, perhaps the Lord bracelets, I'm like, hey, he's one of us. Yeah, I just draw straight. Hey, they know about faith. Man, they're believing God. When I see those red serve shirts, serving in the community, passing out meals during Thanksgiving, hams for fams, all these parties that we're going to do throughout Christmas, caring for orphans and single moms, I'm thinking, man, that's, that's part of our tribe. Just the very sight brings strength. How many of you know courage is not only a choice, but it's also a community? How are you with me? Let, me? let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. Finally, what it says here, verse 12, this is what, what Joab tells his brother. He says, be of good courage and let us be courageous. Why? It's not just for us, but it's for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. I want to ask the team to come up and they can play. Not only is, is courage a, a choice, not only is it a community But number three, it's a call. We are called to be courageous. And this word, this word courage in the Hebrew, in this passage of Scripture, I want you to see this. There's a Hebrew word being used here in this context, and it's the word hazak, H-A-Z-A-K, hazak. It's where Hezekiah got his name, the great king of Judah, Hezekiah, Hazak, courageous. And it literally means this. And I want to ask Terry to come on up here for a second. The word Hazak, courage, let us be courageous. It literally means to tie. It means to wrap around or to fasten. Okay. When he's saying, let us be courageous, he's saying, Let us hold tightly to and not let go of. That's what the word courage means. I want you to see this picture here, okay? 
And Terry, you're with you. You're going to be the bad guy in this illustration. Is that okay? All right, come on, show your love for T.O. He's really a good guy. Great guy, but in this illustration, he's a bad guy. Okay? Hey, you better let me win, man. I'm the pastor. <laughs> Today, you're Alabama, dude. You're losing, man. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, so courage here in this. I want you to, here's the picture that God's trying to create for us. You know, again, some of you are battling feelings and you're fighting issues and there are things coming against you, but you got to make a choice. Then once you make a decision to be courageous, you got to surround yourself with people who have that same spirit. But ultimately, there's a call. And, and, and God wants us to see that when it comes to issues of faith, the devil can try to pull our faith from us. But you know what? We're tied to something greater. You know, we're, we're anchored to a power Whatever it is that's coming against you, I want you to know there's a power inside of you that's greater. And so this word courage, it means to wrap or to tie. Check this out. I'm going to take a grip here, and Terry can pull as hard as he wants to. Not, not too hard. <laughs> He's not taking this from my hand. Why? I've made a decision. My mind is made up. I'm not moved by what I see or even how I feel. The choice for courage has been made. Some of you are fighting for your marriage. The enemy's trying to, to rob you of the joy in a relationship. And you guys say, nope, devil, not, not today. You're not going to take my faith. You're not going to take my peace. You're not going to take my joy. You can pull all you want to, but this thing is wrapped and tied securely. You're going to have to pull my arm out of my body before you take this out of my hand. Come on, are you with me? And so God wants you. He wants you to say, Mike, I'm tired. Some of you have been pulling. It's this tug of war, this tension that you have felt for a long time, and you're tired. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, so take a new grip with your tired hands. Come on, somebody. You need to take a new grip with your tired hands, and you need to strengthen your weak knees. That's what the community of courage allows us to do. If you're weak and weary and worn out, you can take a new grip, and you can dig in and say, the God who is for me is greater than anything that comes against me. Amen. Do you believe that today?